God. All right, so I'd love to welcome you today. So we are talking about, you know, whether we have actually got a skill shortage in STEM today or whether there's a bit of a perception problem. Um, and before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the um, true custodians of the land wherever you live. I am up in Sydney, so I think I might be on Gadigal land, but I normally live on Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nation, where I live, love and work. And I would like to pay my respects and continue to um, tread softly on the land and vote yes to the referendum in November. Um, and so I would very much like to introduce Dr. Molly Muse to you. So this was set up so quickly because um, Ivan Harrison interviewed, uh, introduced me to Morley and I had the most fabulous talk with her on Thursday. She does have a careers fair coming up for women in STEM on the 6th of September. So as a favour to her, I said, look, let's try and get something up and running. I could probably get 20 people online um, or 20 people registered and I've I've got almost 80 and, and a whole bunch of you online. Um, so, uh, so Molly absolutely blew me away with her experience and what it is that she's trying to do in this space. So not only is she a fabulous, fabulous scientist, but she's a member on a number of boards. Um, she provides a lot of advice to diversity organizations and is a passionate believer that we need to have more women in STEM. And I just uh, took a photo of it. LinkedIn did an article, I uh, did a post uh, that I got tagged in. Only 14% of women are employed in STEM roles in Australia compared to 29% of men. So that's new LinkedIn research. I went off to try and find it. And the question was, how can we improve the representation of Aussie women in STEM? But I think one of the things that uh, Molly and I talked about was how could we also improve the rep representation of women of colour and also the fact that so many women um, uh, do get their qualifications and then they go overseas to work. So how do we retain the talent and how do we retain it into the organisation? Um, Put questions in the comments as we go through and uh, at the end we'll get Molly to answer any of those um, or raise your hand um, and and let's uh, let's see if we can't get a whole lot of questions answered. And I can see here today, Molly, we have got a lot of people on this uh, chat who are all recruiting in STEM. Um, if you want to know about the careers fair, <laughs> Scan here and that will take you to the information. Um, I'll keep my big head out of the way. All right, Molly, my gorgeous, fantastic, brilliant woman who I have loved speaking to. I'm going to shut up and let you speak. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrea, for that very fabulous, warm introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining in. Um, it's just so lovely seeing your lovely faces. I always love to see, um, you know, people who are engaged in this discussion. And I love it, especially when I see more men, because we need we need all the support we can get. It can't just be um, women um, doing it. So I'll give you a little bit about my background and how I got into this space and into this very um, simple but very complex problem in the first place. Um, Molly, I was born in Nigeria, West Africa. I moved to Australia 11 years ago, completed my bachelor's in chemical and environmental engineering from Nottingham University in the UK. And I also completed a master's um, in sustainable power engineering from the University of South Wales in Cardiff. When I moved to Australia, honestly, I Good didn't think... You, uh, hello, Ryan. Uh, I didn't think um, there was any issues whatsoever being a female engineer because I've always been passionate about the field. 
a couple of years um, after moving to Australia, I began my PhD. Now, at the time when the opportunity came to do my PhD, I don't know if I should say unfortunately, it should be fortunately, but um, right. I just had my first son. So it was three weeks after having my first son. Now, this shouldn't be a problem, right? Unfortunately, it was. Um, not because it was difficult having the baby and doing a PhD, but that was my first introduction into gender equity in STEM. Now, I'm one of those people you'll find that if there is a problem, I try to fix it. If I can't fix it, I just don't speak about it. So the first thing I did was um, back in Victoria University in Melbourne, I began the Women in Science and Engineering Club. This was way back in 2016. The conversation around gender equity in STEM was still just kicking off and, and gaining momentum. I did that was the inaugural president, but I wanted something more challenging because I could see that not only were female students starting out in engineering, but they were dropping out by second year, but it was a problem Australia-wide. So I got engaged with women in STEM Australia, engaged with the organization. It's the first pioneer um, women in STEM group across Australia. And through that, I also got um, very privileged, unique opportunities to work with a couple of um, well-reputable STEM organizations, including CSIRO on a unique program called Innovation Catalyst, uh, encouraging female academics to commercialize their research project and also to get cited. With all of my engagements with um, several women in STEM groups, so for example, I sit on the board with the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, a unique program called Elevate STEM, which really focuses on providing scholarships for girls in STEM from undergraduate up to postgraduate and um, leadership levels. And I also engage with Science Technology Australia as a mentor for the Superstars of STEM um, program and also on their um, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Now, post PhD, I worked in consulting and in construction. At the time, <laughs> I was pregnant again with my third son. You know, when you think about the issues that women have to navigate, you would wonder what's the best time to actually have some of these life um, decisions. There is no perfect time. But my take is if a woman sees a job ad and she thinks she's qualified, she meets all of the tick boxes, then she should do the job. As an employer, um, I find as an employer, if you are concerned, there are ways in which you can have those conversations and we'll come to that. But look, working in construction, I saw that there was a lot of gap currently in Australia, um, women in construction on site in office is still sitting around the 10% margin, not good enough. Broadly, for engineers, it's still around 11.3%. That has since grown a little bit, but it's still very poor, sitting at that very low numbers. Now, the other thing that I noticed was on site and everywhere around STEM with my broad engagement, I hardly saw women from diverse backgrounds. So I noticed that when we have the conversation around um, gender equity in STEM, most times the conversation stops at gender. It doesn't really delve into gender intersection, race, ethnicity, disability, sexuality, all of the different intersections. And these are very important because um, we can't, um, we, we understand that certain groups have more difficulties or more challenges in um, the conversation around gender equity. But what really, I guess, motivated me and worried me was the fact that we have this conversation that's been ongoing around the STEM skills shortage. Now, last year, we had the Jobs and Skills Summit in Canberra. Again, there was a lot of emphasis on the STEM skills shortage. As a scientist, as a researcher, I began to question, do we really have a STEM skills shortage or do we have a perception problem? So I began some personal research and investigation into this problem. The first place I looked at, which is where any scientist will look at, is um, the chief scientist report. So every four years um, in Australia, 
there is um, this chief scientist report that provides an overview on the current ecosystem for STEM across Australia. In that report, it's called the Australian STEM Workforce Report. I think um, chapter 10 focused broadly on women in STEM. The findings were just really, really fascinating. I saw from that report that there are only 29% of women in the STEM workforce. Now, Andrea, the statistics that you quoted, um, recently we've had um, 2023, the STEM equity monitor report that has just been released, I think last month. That report showed that for women working in STEM with STEM qualifications, we have just 15% of women working in STEM with STEM qualifications. Now, from the previous statistics that are quoted from the Australian STEM Workforce Report, I saw another statistic that really um, blew my mind. I saw that 56% of university qualified women in STEM in Australia are Australian women born overseas. Now, these are not women who are on like temporary migrants or students. They may have come through those channels, but there are women that have come to come us call Australia home. Women like myself, 56% of university qualified women fall within that category. But what's most shocking is that they experience four times higher unemployment rates. Why this really shocked me, again, is because of the narrative we have a STEM skills shortage problem. When I saw those numbers, I became really disturbed to the point that I had to quit my job and I began iSTEM. Personally, I had experienced my own fair share of challenges, as you can imagine, being a woman in, in, in being a female engineer, a woman in, in construction, a black woman in construction. Unfortunately, you can't rule that out a pregnant black woman in construction, a pregnant black woman, <laughs> um, all of that. So I always joke and I say, if you were to crown a queen of diversity, you'd probably give it to me. So I started iSTEMCO. I started iSTEMCO. Um, we are a research consulting and mostly a talent sourcing organization. We work with STEM companies to help them find talent. So when I started engaging with companies across Australia, telling them that, look, we can help you find women because they, they were saying, oh, we can't find women. We can't find software engineers. We can't find engineers to do the job. And I kept telling them, look, we've got access to women. Um, what we did last year, we, we had multiple, multiple programs. Now, if you follow my work, I try not to, I try to bring awareness to the program, to the, to the problem, sorry, but I try not to finger point to say, hey, you, hey, you, you're getting this wrong. No, because if we come from that angle, I don't think we'll be solving the problem. So I come from a very collaborative point. I listen to employers and I listen to women. And through my interactions from both sides, we have been able to curate several programs. Last day, we launched a career fair for women in STEM, an in-person career fair. I was so surprised to learn that that was the first in-person careers fair for women in STEM across Australia. We had collaborated with Victoria University because we were bootstrapping. We were just myself and my co-founder, Dr. Wangi Fernando. She's a data scientist and an AI specialist. We began this um, careers fair having a space that should accommodate maximum 70 people. Guess what? We had over 120 people in attendance. We had about 13 STEM organizations. And through that, we're able to create at least 20 new employment opportunities for women in STEM. Since then, we've helped directly and indirectly at least 100 women to gain employment in STEM. And our women come from recent graduates, early career professionals, mid and senior level career professionals. There is so much focus on getting more girls into STEM, which I agree, I do a lot of work in that regard. Um, I've had multiple engagements with the Girls in Physics Breakfast where um, I've um, spoken on their panels. But at the same time, 
if we are trying to get more girls into STEM, there is this saying, they say you can't be what you can't see. Last year, I was fortunate to win the Emerging Leader in STEM Award um, from Women's Agenda. When I went on stage, honestly, I cried. And um, I honestly didn't think I would win. It, it was enough getting nominated and even making it to be a finalist. But I cried for several reasons. There is the saying that you can't be what you can't see. And I told them that, look, <laughs> when I meet a lot of women that I engage with, there is that emphasis on um, there are just a few of us. But look, when you have an intersectional diversity to the current gender diversity problem, it becomes even more difficult. So I told them, unfortunately for some of us, we have to use the power of our imagination. Because if you can't be what you can't see, then you can perhaps try to reimagine what you want to be or what you would like others to see and be that. And for me, I hope that that's what I demonstrate every single day of my life. And that's why I do what I do, that simple. From all of our learnings, we then created there a, an in, in, inclusive platform for employers and for women. We noticed that a lot of the women that fall in that category of 56% university qualified women, Australian women with STEM skills, having no jobs, engineers doing aged care jobs, disability jobs, tech people doing, you know, like Uber jobs. There is nothing wrong with any of those jobs. There is dignity in labor, which I support. But if we have people who have been trained to be scientists, engineers, technologists, and they are doing like age care, disability, child care, we are losing out as a country, as a sector, we are losing out financially. There is evidence, um, a McKinsey study that shows that having diverse teams would improve your profits by 33%. And there is, studies that show that getting more women into work would increase the Australian economy by $25 billion. So sometimes when you talk about getting more women into work, it almost sounds like charity. But I tell employers that, look, no, it's not charity. Diversity is actually the new innovation. For most of us here, we would remember Nokia and we would remember Kodak. We all had those Kodak moments, right? Growing up, I'm sure I did. They were like the big giants then, but something happened to Nokia and Kodak. The stories are very um, similar. They failed to tap into the digital age. They failed to innovate. By 2025, 90% of the jobs in Australia would need STEM skills. Currently, we have 1.9 million workers in STEM across Australia. By 2025, there will be additional 1 million STEM um, tech roles needed. So who are the people that are going to fill those roles? If we have a society with an almost equal um, gender balance, but we are having just under a quarter of a particular you know, gender, then there is a problem. So it means that we would be losing our money so without um, taking much of your time, some of the solutions that we have curated, we have there, it's an inclusive platform. What we are doing for this year's careers fair, we are making things a little bit different. We already have um, over 50 women who have registered to attend our careers fair. We have employers who have registered like Metro Trains, Arup, um, Westpark, um, VMware, CSL, Spoken to Wally, we've got Engineers Australia, Australian Computer Society, a lot of companies and organizations um, that will be coming for this year's Careers Fair. 
what we've done also to encourage the work that you do as an organization, we've provided a one month um, free access, a free access to the DARE platform. I'll tell you some unique features about the platform. When we began speaking to women um, that couldn't find work, unfortunately, most of them from migrant background began telling us that they had to do things like changing their names on their resume. They had to change their names to English names as plainly as, I don't know how else I could put it. Um, because with their names, they found it difficult to even secure, to even get to the point of an interview. Their resumes weren't being looked at. And I have multiple, multiple, multiple um, stories to this effect to what I've just shared. So what we did was, Rwange and I, we decided to use technology to put that question to rest. And that's what there is. So with there, we've got anonymous recruitment. As a candidate, when you go into a platform and you create a profile, you're assigned a number. Elements such as your name, your gender, your, your if, if your country of qualification was gotten elsewhere other than Australia, is all blind. So it's all completely anonymous. So as an employer, you can see the skills, you can see the qualifications of the candidate, but those elements that will make you discriminate them are completely um, anonymous. And then we've also got a jobs benchmark, um, standardized interview for um, our candidates. We are now also incorporating AI to effectively match candidates um, efficiently to employers. So it's a complete game changer. I would encourage you to sign up for our career sphere. We've got um, three sponsor packages or opportunities. We've got a um, bronze, $3,000, but that's for employers outside Melbourne because we would be bringing a hybrid event for this year's event. We've also got our gold sponsorship that gives you um, a stand access to the event. We would we are beginning from tomorrow a spotlight for, on our employers. We want women to know where to look for. We don't want them to waste their time because the problem is not just employment. Sometimes some companies do well in getting more women employed. Now, when you go into their reports to check um, on, on that report, they say, oh yeah, we've got so and so amount of women. But when you do proper investigation, maybe more than half have resigned. So the problem is not so much focus on diversity and inclusion. The biggest problem is actually retention. Retention is the reason why women are not becoming leaders. Simply put, companies pushing hard for diversity, but they lack inclusion. I always give this analogy of animals grazing on a moorland. When the, when the grass is green, they graze and they sleep. But if it's yellow or if it's brown, they eat and they move on. No one wants to sleep on a yellow grass. They move on. So if you as an employer have a retention problem, then you have to create a, a, a sense of belonging. Unfortunately, most times this job falls on the HR, which is totally unfair. I say that because HRs are not equipped to deal with cultural problems. They are not equipped to deal with um, um, these kind of issues. And then for women, especially women um, from um, marginalized background, First Nations women, women of color, women from culturally, linguistically um, diverse background, when they encounter problems and issues at, at work, they say go to HR. HR tells you go to EAP. I experienced that problem. And you're not having a mental health breakdown because of some personal issues. It's solely because of work. Now, when people don't feel heard, you know, sometimes these, these candidates would feel employee surveys, nothing gets done. When people don't feel heard, eventually they take their skills somewhere else, they leave. And you, you wouldn't blame them for leaving. I'll take, for example, this kind of Sprite, right? On the bottle of, of Sprite. If you go to Coles, this same bottle of Sprite, within the pack, it's probably priced at 50 cents. At the counter, same Coles, it's probably priced at $2.50.
Same bottle of Sprite on an airplane, it's probably priced at $5.50. In a club, it's probably priced at $7. Now, the, the bottle of, of Sprite hasn't changed. It's still the same bottle. What has changed, however, is space. As a scientist, you know, time and space are very two important elements that we can tweak to make things happen. So when people don't feel valued, they don't feel heard, they would simply change space. So I'm going to shut up and stop talking because I know you have um, questions. Um, I'm going to take some of your questions so we can maximize so, um, and get into the discussion. Thanks. Um, look, folks, uh, there is, I, I actually put a question in um, and, and I think I was actually um, sending the question to the audience, you know, why do we have a problem recruiting women and more in particular women of colour and people from backgrounds that are not traditionally Australian as such, they've been qualified elsewhere? Is it is it that we don't understand what the qualifications are? Are we inherently racist? Do we not know what to do? And I ask that question because we've been doing a lot of work with the field who do um, people with a disability job board and they did a webinar with us a couple of weeks ago and at our Melbourne event there was a lot of talk around the accommodations that we have to make for a person with a disability and the fear around recruiting them 88 percent of people don't need accommodations to join us in the workforce so is there a barrier there for people in TA and HR and hiring managers and the business around how to recruit women and particularly women in colour? Um, feel free, anybody, to, to come on and challenge that assumption. Turn your mute off and speak up. Hello, I'm Bree. I'm happy to jump in here. Um, yes. And lovely to, to meet you, um, Dr. Morley, as well. Um, I think some of the, the barriers that, that I've seen throughout my career are um, things like eligibility requirements to roles. Um, my career for the last eight years has spent early careers as well, um, so that real entry level point into, into work and into technology. Um, and we are at times really bound by um, they must hold Australian or New Zealand citizenship or Australian permanent residency. And then we go out to multiple careers fairs and I'm just looking at all of the incredible female talent that are there ready and, and waiting to start work. Um, so that that has been a challenge. And I know that it's around things like sponsoring at the end of their degrees that, that can be those barriers uh, for employment. So that's just one observation that I've that I've seen. Is, is that barrier, and look, I, you know, forgive me, I've been out of Australian recruiting for quite some time. It was certainly a lot easier in London. But is that because of government requirements in immigration or is it because of uh, requirements? Like we do know that there are companies that work in defence or government that have to have Australian citizens, but is mm. it more getting that sponsorship? Absolutely. And like for, I've done both London and Australian recruitment as well at all at all levels from grad to executive. And, um, you know, you do need to be paid a certain amount to be sponsored at, at a lot of companies as well. And sometimes that far exceeds a graduate salary. Um, so, it, so companies aren't able to sponsor a particular role, um, which would really limit your talent pool to, to local talent and domestic talent, which is why we have conversations around there being shortages when I really like the way that you've positioned it. Or is, is it just a perception though that, that they definitely exist? There are definitely women ready to, to start a career in STEM. And, uh, and, and thank you so much for your input there, Brie. Really appreciate that. Um, and Melanie Shaw's actually put on here untrained recruiters, you know, recruiters that aren't trained properly don't help. Melanie, do you want to come on and add to that at all? Um. Uh, probably everyone's had the experience here, like you've applied for a job and you get, no offence, a very junior, unexperienced box ticker come on and ask you a series of very basic questions. They don't have the maturity or, you know, the, the thinking to think outside the box when they are recruiting. So that that's a that's a big issue that I know a lot mm. of uh, 
women of colour or people um, who first come to Australia um, have that issue when when they're trying to um, go for interviews. Um, and there, there is that biased racism, unfortunately, um, as well in sort of untrained recruiters. They look at names or, you know, that you haven't had any experience in, you know, Australia and it, it's an issue. Like, I, you know, training those young, I feel like we need a training course for, um, you know, young recruiters in in recruiting agencies. Um, yes. Well, look, and and to be fair, um, it's across the board. That was my experience when I came back here in two thousand and fifteen as a fifty year old woman. Was um, I was too old, um, and it was like they couldn't put me into a box. And as I as as many of you know, I'm always the last one on the podium dancing at uh, at the Itas. Um, <laughs> So still lots of energy left in, in me. But, yeah, it was a case of being too old, uh, which is a whole other issue which we'll get on to. Um, uh, Brenda's here saying that they've changed the duration of post-study visa or in, for international students to a minimum of four years. And Jay is also saying the change to immigration laws have contributed to companies no longer sponsoring people at the entry or lower levels. So there does seem to be uh, some... But I read some of the um, comments and um, I'll just um, provide some insight on some of the comments. And um, mm. look, Brie, thank you so much for um, sharing and providing um, insights on eligibility barrier. <clears throat> now, with the programs or with the um, solutions that we've created, we have considered several different angles. Because for me, I'm not just a woman in STEM, but I've also been very fortunate to sit on um, multiple advisory policy, name it, consulting. Just recently, um, the Diversity in STEM review, they had reached out and um, I had a closed meeting with them providing insight. Um, science, technology, STEM career pathway, same thing. Now, these are the problems. I don't think it's so much of an eligibility criteria issue because these particular women that I'm talking about have moved on to become Australian citizens. So they are Australian citizens, but they still don't have jobs. So it's not so much of an eligibility issue. Now for the ones who are not Australian citizens, like Andrea um, clearly um, put, with our defense roles, yes, they are, you know, there are some roles that unfortunately we can't, um, um, we, we, we can't tweak. That's true, like defense, it's mandatory. And that's like maybe a very tiny, insignificant percentage of, of the STEM jobs, if you ask me. For majority of the roles, the criteria is very simple. You just have to have the opportunity or the eligibility to work in Australia, which these women meet those criteria. Still, they don't have jobs. So again, there was um, the emphasis on barriers to sponsoring. Most of these women don't need any sponsorship from companies. Okay, let's take, for example, the ones who are not Australian citizens, say they are Australian permanent residents already. They don't need sponsorship. Or let's say they are on temporary visas but their temporary visas allows them to work. Again, not all of them need sponsorship. So they might very well be able to do the 189 or 190 because even the employer sponsorship pathway, it's getting a lot more difficult, but we hear you. So what we've done in iSTEM, I would introduce some of our programs. We've got direct recruitment for our direct recruitment, like any other recruitment agency, we, we charge a finder's fee, very low 12%. We also have a program that we introduced last year called the Tryouts to Recruit program. For some of these reasons, 
So the tryout to recruit program is a three month, six month internship program where we get women to work with STEM companies. It's a no obligation to hire program. There is no emphasis at all or, you know, um, um, obligation as a company for you to hire. We take all the risks. So if, for example, there is a risk around um, um, eligibility, visas, sponsorship, um, um, payroll, um, police check, all of that, we, we take on that risk. I stem takes on that risk. We get the women to you. For three months, six months, they work with you. If you like them beyond that period, you keep them. So it's kind of like a probation without the risks. And some companies like this, we had um, at least four women complete their programs with Southeast Water on this tryout program. Now, when you hear tryout, it almost seems like they are recent graduates. No, three out of four of those women have PhDs. So when people say things like eligibility, I try to understand what, sorry, my brain just doesn't get it. Like I try to understand what, you know, um, what exactly, because some of these women, a quarter of the women in our database have PhDs. At least half of them have a master's degree qualification. And we don't only work with women who are recent graduates. So two weeks ago, I was at I was the keynote speaker at the Women in Leadership and um, Development. It's called Wild, Wild for STEM. So it's for senior, um, for women in STEM wanting to get to the next level senior executive level. So there is that problem for women also wanting to get to the next leadership level. So it's not just entry level. A lot of women are stuck. They are, they are battling issues with confidence and all of that. So these women are clearly, um, they meet all of the eligibility criteria for the job. They are just not getting in. So the real issue here, um, if, you know, I'm assuming this is a safe space, is discrimination. There is no other issue why they are not getting employed. Now, the other thing that we did, I liked, um, there was a comment around HR being untrained. I agree with that. I think it's totally unfair to make people do multiple jobs in an organization. <clears throat> and this is from HR to even people of um, color and people from marginalized background. Oftentimes, these people, are made to do that the co companies consult them extra and they don't pay them for their time. It's like extra consulting. If the company is not equipped to do those jobs, then you should be able to look outside and get the people in who can get this job done. It's very simple. It helps you save money. It helps you save time. So what we also introduce is a mentoring retention program. The mentoring retention program is such that it's really targeted at early career professionals. Because as you rightly put, Andrea, when women come in, they don't stay, they leave. So we have 27% of um, women in STEM workforce. Um, we have over 30% of women graduate from university STEM qualification, but only 15% of women working in STEM with STEM qualification, only they are only 15%. So the problem is they are coming in, but they are not staying. So retention is a big issue. What we do is we work with um, businesses. We have our own STEM consultants. So these consultants all have diversity and inclusion background, but it's not just diversity and inclusion alone. A lot of people would say they are coaches. A lot of people would say they are DEI consultant. It's almost like this hype word. But if you work in STEM, say for example, you work on the mine site or in construction, you need to be able to understand the intricacies of working in those environments, their safety issue. So without having that experience, it's very, very difficult. It's not not impossible, but it is very challenging to provide support to someone who is. So all of our consultants that work with us, they are all STEM qualified and they all have DEI backgrounds. What we do is we encourage companies to, to purchase this um, mentorship pack for their candidates. 
it's five thousand dollars annual fee, flat fee. We do have workshops that we provide all year round, and then your employees that you purchase this for have access to all of our workshops. The other thing is we also provide one-on-one -on -one support. So sometimes, like I said, when people have those issues, they go to HR, HR says go to EAP, that's not the way. So when they have that additional support, they come to us, it's very confidential. We don't reveal the names of the women to their employers. We, we would just rather tell you, hey, Ryan, we think these are the things that can be implemented in your company. Of course, if things escalate, then we have to do you know what we have to do. But it's very confidential support. And then the women feel heard. So it's no longer just a dumb um, feeling employee survey that never sees the light of day. But with this, you actually, as a business, understand and really genuinely know what's going on because we provide reports to your business at the end. Companies like Arrow were very keen on this program. We're also um, speaking currently with Telstra, with big companies to really see that we help companies to keep women because we can't keep losing um, talents. It's, it's, it doesn't help us as an economy. It doesn't help us at all. Um, that's what, like I've mentioned two programs, the tryout to recruit and the mentoring retention program. Now, the other thing that we also provide so this is just for women. This is not for employers. It's employability workshops. So we noticed, of course, and this is not just for cowed women. Everyone, if you have moved countries, you would experience culture shock. And it has nothing to do with, it's not just, I mean, it's more, it's more challenging for people from um, culturally diverse backgrounds, but I don't think it's, it's exclusive to them alone. For example, I was born in Nigeria. I lived in the UK. I lived in, in Malaysia. Um, I'm Australian now. I've lived in five continents of the seven that we have. And I can tell you very, very clearly, between just Western um, countries, the US, just take for example, the US, UK, and Australia, there are a lot of significant differences. You know, so culture shock is a real thing. So sometimes it's not just it's not just the color, it's really just even moving countries. You know, people experience those kind of um, culture shock. So it's really providing that additional support to for your employees to know that they are, they are seen, they are heard, and they will stay. So those are some of the programs that we provide. And then with the employability workshop, what we do is we tell women how to, you know, um, resume building. We tell them things like how to build your resume, your confidence, uh, what to expect, how to present yourself in, um, for interviews. With the women that we've worked with, over 80%, we've seen over 80% um, more employment through our employability workshops. Women that they are trying to apply that, that, that. Unfortunately, some of them are to do change their names again to English names, but whatever, for whatever reason, it's worked. Um, so yeah, so we have pro solution and I'm really, really keen to work with, with all of you. I would like you to get in touch with me. I promise you, I'm very friendly. If I don't reply to you, <laughs> emails immediately. I am. Um, do you know what, Morley? <laughs> I think what I loved so much about it, the talk that we had last week, yeah. was the passion that you display for something that is not that hard to fix. We just have to get cleverer about um about doing it. And there's a lady, Fareen, on our chat group here at the moment um, who has, has talked about her experience in having a PhD and still, you know, trying to get access to people. And it wasn't, you know, the minute we step away from things like using CVs and we start to look at skills-based hiring, we start to look at assessment and we start to think about how can we bring people in in a more inclusive way, which is, is what we're covering in our inclusive uh, workshops that we're doing in Sydney this Thursday, folks, Brisbane next week, Perth on the 7th of September, um, is to put yourself in a person's shoes, apply for your jobs, 
go through the process and see what it is that people are going through, but also get your managers trained on inclusive hiring. Um, you know, <laughs> managers still go in and ask the most inappropriate questions to particularly women. Um, so it seems to me that, you know, we still have a lot of training and a lot of work to do in that space. And I think your passion for this is really important. And I think also because you are coming at it from lived experience um, is a really important part of what you're doing. Um, look, we've just got like 10 minutes to go. Um, so, uh, and Ivan's giving you a big shout out here because he has been working with you at Metri Metro um, Trains. And, uh, you know, the fact that you left a guaranteed salary role to start working in this space, hence why I'm so keen to support you as well. Um, uh, folks, is there any other final questions or comments? No? Okay. So um, what I'm going to do for you all is uh, send you a follow-up email with this recording. I have put all the stuff that Molly sent me in the chat, but don't worry if you haven't picked that up. Um, I've put the brochures in, I've put the website to dare, I've done everything, Molly, as you've been chatting away, but I will send a follow-up email with all of the information uh, that you've talked about today. Um, and if anyone wants to reach out to Molly, that's terrific. If anyone wants to get involved in her career fair uh, on September the 6th, that is online and it is in person in Melbourne, um, and uh, and I've seen the pricing and it's, you know, doesn't seem overly expensive for me. Um, and I would encourage you all to, to have a conversation with Molly and um, and see what you can do. I, I think we need to talk about potentially doing some some training of our TA. Yes. So so we we do provide um, workplace training as well, Andrea. So we work with, for example, with the mentoring um, program. It's not just for the women. So when companies sign up to the mentoring program, they also receive support. So we we do have conversations, especially with that with the women's direct line supervisors and with yeah. the HR. So we provide materials, we provide feedback, we provide materials, we train them on how to be inclusive and to understand, um, to navigate all of all those um dynamics that comes with hiring women, including women of color. Uh, the other thing that we do is I do a lot of um, public speaking engagements, um, a keynote speaker, panel speaker on very reputable um, organizations, events. Uh, I, I will share my bio with Andrea and Andrea, please feel free. I've got both your bios. Oh, I'll yes. Feel free to circulate and um, distribute. So um, I'm happy to come into your business and provide some of these insights that I've shared because it's not just getting the women aware, but, you know, like we also have to ensure that the companies, the businesses are also ready yes. to have them because they need inclusive places to work in, right? So while we get the women pepped up, we have to get the the staff within the business pepped up. And really, unfortunately, sometimes you can't tell that story yourself when you're inside. So yes. you get us in, you know, we do that for you. I promise you I'm very affordable. I'll try to yeah. work within your budget. Um, yeah, I just, I just really want to see that this is no longer a problem. So truly, when we tell young girls, you can become a scientist, you can become an astronaut, you can become an engineer, you can become this and that. They should be able to see their moms, their aunts, their role models in those positions of power. Because if they can't see it, they simply can't be it. I What a brilliant note to end on. Um, Dr. Molly Muse, thank you so much for your generosity and your time in sharing this with us. Um, 
and uh yeah i i so have you flag to be a keynote speaker next week next year on talent blue <laughs> And we're well, talking you. about the future of TA because I think, or the future of talent, because I think as we get more and more multicultural, as our borders shift so much, as as a country, we cannot find enough skilled talent to do our work. Our, our talent teams have to get better at bringing in and supporting and retaining women in the workforce. Um, thank you, my wonderful community, for joining us all today. Um, I'll sit here now and get this email organised so that you can start reaching out to Molly if there's any interest. Um, and if there's any other particular topic you'd like me to cover, do let me know. I'm actually really enjoying doing these. I, I went off them after COVID, but I'm back enjoying doing them again. So um, so if there's any other topics that people want me to cover, trust me, ageism is definitely on my agenda as well. But, um, so Molly, thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to hearing more from you again. Thank you, Andrea. And um, for those um, watching, also, please feel free if you can't um, sponsor the careers fair please feel free to purchase paid forward tickets so we could get more women to come in on the day the tickets are only fifty dollars um they are available on our website and um yeah let's let's stay in touch thank you all right. lovely thank you all oh and you're getting some lovely thank yous on the side there molly <laughs> thank you andrea <laughs>